Our next guest is Dr. Frederick Terman, Professor of Electrical Engineering. Dr. Terman grew up on the Stanford campus as a son of a professor, Lewis Terman. After receiving a degree from Stanford, he went on to MIT where he received his PhD. Then he returned to Stanford and joined the faculty in 1925. For 12 years, he was the only man teaching electronics or radio of any kind in the Department of Engineering. Those must have been unusual years of a one-man faculty, and perhaps Dr. Terman can tell us what that experience was like. Well, actually, in the, um, I started off, uh, when I started teaching, I was teaching a variety of things, but uh, no one was offering a course in uh, what today we call electronics, which then we called radio engineering. And so I thought uh, one ought to be started, and I gave a course one year, and then the next year I stretched it so that it was a course each term. And uh, that was the beginning. And actually, for all those 12 years, I taught things other than uh, uh, purely electronics. So it was only a fraction of a man faculty, oh. really. Now there are about uh, uh, oh, 40 or so that uh, uh, doing this. So you might say that I've been replaced by quite a number of people. But the field has broadened. There is one book, uh, you've written several, but there's one which almost every radio engineer in America and many around the world uh, have made their Bible. This is your book, Radio Engineering. Uh, I understand that it has uh, sold over 300,000 copies. Tell us how you happened to write this book. Well, it was sort of an ac almost an accident. Um, uh, McGraw-Hill Book Company uh, representative was calling on me and as they do to help sell their books and locate potential manuscripts. And uh, I was complaining about the lack of satisfactory textbook for this uh, electronics course I was teaching and said that someday I was going to write one that would really do the job. Well, apparently he needed a book of this kind, the same as I did. So he got on my neck and got the president of the publishing company to write me a, a letter and he followed it up. And, and so I got kind of pressured into this for which I've always been grateful to him. I'm sure McGraw-Hill has been grateful, too. I understand it's had many translations. Yes, there are translations and pirated editions. Some in, uh, I was over in Taiwan last uh, summer, and there were actually two, two editions of this book uh, extant in Taiwan, one pirated and the other legitimate, but both uh, 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 independent photo offset printings of the original. Including the title page with your name oh, yes. and everything? Oh, yes. Well, I'm glad they've left you in the book. <laughs> <laughs> the only people that ever left me out were the Russians, who translated one of my books. And up where the author's name should be, the Russian translator's name would be. And in his preface, he said that my book had been of great assistance in compiling his work. Oh, the understatement <laughs> of the year. <laughs> When Dr. Terman, when you uh, retired after serving Stanford long and well as uh, Dean of Engineering and Provost and Vice President of the University, it was said of you uh, at uh, that time that you were the man who, more than any other single person, was responsible for the Bay Area becoming a wor world-renowned center of electronics industry and research. I'm not going to ask you to either acknowledge this or deny it, but do tell us something of the development of this industry here in the Palo Alto area. Well, uh, somewhat of an exaggeration because this wasn't built up by any one person or even one or two or three people. But uh, we had the ingredients before World War II of some independent, creative, owner-managed companies uh, in the area, small companies but nevertheless, they were working on their own ideas, and the, the people who had the ideas were running them, and they were good people. Now, this sort of found, formed a foundation, and after World War II, uh, things began to uh, uh, broaden out and uh, get uh, uh, more active and uh, uh, more people involved. Now, I was uh, at the university and had always been interested in these little companies, and so we sort of worked together with them, really helping each other uh, develop and grow. And I would say the university made a major contribution 
to the development here, but then the companies made a major contribution to the development of those parts of the university that contributed to these companies. So we all grew up together, really, and uh, turned out very well. I'd like to ask you now, in retrospect, um, do you think this industrialization that has taken place in the Palo Alto area is a good thing? Uh, we hear sometimes that we are being overcome, uh, the charm of the city of Palo Alto is being lost. What would you say to this? Well, there are certainly lots of complaints about uh, things and objections to changes and the like. But um, interesting thing, you find that particularly in the last 25 years when this d growth and changes have come about, you find that in that period, uh, the people who came to Palo Alto irrespective of when they came, always liked the town the way it was when they arrived. If they came here 20 years ago, they loved the Palo Alto of that time, and they complain about the changes and the increased traffic and the uh, in, uh, more uh, land being built on and so on. If they uh, came here uh, five or eight or 10 years ago, they like it that way, and they're perfectly content. And the fact that each new, uh, each new group of you might say immigrants that come here and settle down in Palo Alto, like the town the way it was when they arrived, even if they only arrived fairly recently, means that it can't all be bad. I think you've answered my question beautifully. Thanks so much for being with us.